I'm Michael Granoff, and um, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm proud to say that I was here kind of at the creation uh, of NDN 12 years and many political epochs ago. Uh, at that time of peace and prosperity, the biggest worry that I had was the uh, creeping protectionism uh, within the Democratic Party. And when I heard uh, Simon's description uh, in his usual thoughtful, articulate, and visionary way, I was really captivated and been involved with NDN ever since. Uh, it was not unlike the feeling that I had last year when I met Shai Agassi. We talk a lot in this organization and in this city about leadership. The definition of leadership that I subscribe to is a visionary with a sound strategy for implementing his vision and an ability to inspire others to be passionate about that vision. And I think by that definition, Simon and Shai are two of the most outstanding leaders that I've had the privilege to know. <coughs> Shai was born in Israel where he founded several software companies while he was still in his early 20s. In 2001, one of those companies was acquired by the German giant SAP, uh, the third largest software company in the world. Shai and his family moved to Silicon Valley, where he quickly rose through the ranks and became the president of products at SAP. SAP has a reputation for preferring gray hairs and young, uh, to young hotshots and Germans to non-Germans. So when he was named to the executive board of SAP at the age of 31, it was really quite remarkable. Later, Shai became the presumptive successor to the CEO at SAP. Shai has also been a part of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders, where some of the world's brightest and most accomplished young people gather to discuss the world's problems. It was there that Shai described, uh, was asked what he has described as a very annoying question. What are you going to do to make the world a better place by 2020? As Shai talked about the question with his peers, he quickly came yeah, to the conclusion the that there was no single thing he could do that could do more to improve the world than to find a way to break its addiction to oil. Transportation, as you know, is vital not only to our standard of living, but really to our very survival. We have come to take for granted that an orange grown and harvested in Florida on Monday can be consumed in Washington on Tuesday. And uh, transportation is 98% dependent on oil. And as I'm sure you're all aware, yesterday oil hit a record high of $109 a barrel, up sixfold in the last 10 years. There are doubts about the capacity of, of its supply, and there are a few doubts about the effect that it has on uh, the environment, most particularly with regard to climate change. And also, um, there are a few doubts about the effect that it has on geopolitics. As Shimon Peres has described, oil makes a mockery of democracy. So we know it's the lifeblood of our economy. It's getting more expensive every day. It may be ruining the planet and funding some bad guys, and we may be running out. Those are a bunch of good reasons to find an alternative to oil. And like I said, vision, leadership is not just vision, but it's also implementation. Shine not only imagined, imagined a world in which transport functioned without oil, he crafted a strategy to create one, and to do it without having to invent anything new to do it with technology that is here and now. That is the idea which Shai will describe to you became Project Better Place. Initially, Shai conceived this as a way for governments to move their countries off of oil, and he took the idea to Shimon Peres, now the president of Israel. Peres told Shai he had a great idea, but true to the founding principles of this organization, the great innovations come not from governments, but from the private sector. Shai said, I guess you'll have to find somebody to start a company. Paris said, what about you? Shai said, well, I'm going to be the next CEO of SAP. And Paris said, well, you'll have to just decide what's more important. And thus, Shai departed SAP and began what I believe will be a company that truly changes the rules, a company that does for cars in the 21st century what Ford did for them in the 20th century, a company that does for transportation what Google has done for information. With that modest ambition in mind, please welcome Project Better Place CEO Shai Agassi. I'm, I'm never as good as the words that my grandma uses to describe me. In the, the, the long and short story of it is, I, uh, in the words of Al Gore, I used to be presented as the next CEO at SAP. And, uh, and I, uh, I came up with this crazy idea, and I lost my job. And, uh, and as a result of that, you're all going to need to sit through about 15 minutes discussion of how we end oil. Um, I'll start with the end of the story, at least the first chapter of that story, and that's uh, a, a, what I believe is a historic event that happened on January 21st this year in Jerusalem. And um, I was told to pick it up. 
we had for the first time in one place, the same time, all elements that are required in order to make electric vehicles the, the dominant form of transportation for, for a country. Um, we had the President and the Prime Minister of Israel standing up and declaring that Israel will get off oil for all transportation needs within a decade and set a policy, very simple policy, which we'll talk about, to actually make that happen. We had the, the CEO of two large car companies, actually the only CEO in the world that runs two companies in two continents um, in the world, Carlos Ghosn, the CEO of Renault Nissan, stand up and say, we can make these cars, we can mass produce them, we can make them as cheap as cars today, they will be good and convenient, and people will like those cars. And then we'll mass produce them by 2011, as many as you can buy, we will make. We also had NEC Nissan stand up and say, we have the batteries to make this reality. It's not science fiction, we have the batteries and we have a factory that can actually make it. We had us, Project Better Place, stand up and say, we can build the infrastructure network required for these cars and we will do it before the cars show up. See, there's something fascinating about networks and infrastructure. If you build them after people buy the product, people just don't buy the products. So if I told you that you're, we have a new cell phone that has no waves and is not cancerous and all the other phones kill you, but we need 100,000 people to buy the phones before, before we put the first cell tower, you'll say, I want to sign up, sign me up as 100,001. It's the same thing we've done with electric vehicles. The, f the last element we had, which makes this different than a framework or a document or a book, is we had investors who put in $200 million to fund this product, to fund this company on day one. This is the largest seed round of any venture in history. And the $200 million allow us to take what is required in this story and put it in the ground before the cars show up. Now, put all together, policy, car, company, uh, car, country, network and money and you can take a country off oil faster than a decade and I'll, what I'll try and describe to you today is what is this policy, what is this framework, how does it happen, how does it move on from where we are from the, this January 21st 2008 event. Start with policy because we're in DC. This is actually the, I, I just, I met the Prime Minister in Israel last week, he says it's the first time they're getting calls almost every day from countries around the world asking for a law that was passed in Israel that other countries want to copy. It never happened before. And, and, uh, and they're translating the law to English and they're putting it on their website because people just say, we want the same thing. It's fairly simple. Israel used to have 85% tax on cars. Why? When you ask Israelis, they tell you it's pretty straightforward. We don't like oil. We know what it does to us, what it does to our kids, what it does to the environment, but the, the geopolitical price we pay for oil is pretty obvious to us every day. So what they did is they took the tax on cars down from 85% into two brackets. 72% if your car goes on oil, 10% if it doesn't. And then they said something revolutionary. They said, we will keep that differentiated tax policy for the next 10 years, till 2019. Why 10 years? Because we don't believe that 10 years from now anybody would even want to buy a gasoline-based car. But in the next 10 years, that will be the delta, 60% or more. Now what we'll do is, as more people buy electric cars, we will raise both taxes up. So we'll play with the dial so that we make our money as a government. See, we don't want to give you money. We want to make our money, but we'll move it up as we see demand coming in. If you're an early adopter, you buy the cars first, good for you. You're going to actually sell them for more than you bought them. So there's an incentive for you to move first. If you didn't move first, well, tough. But you still pay less than 72%, so there's a great incentive for you. And you'll see us moving it up, and at some point, there'll be 70% and 130%. Why? Because nobody will buy a gasoline-based car, and we will make our 70% tax as a country. It's fairly straightforward. That's the policy. Everything else around it, the other 20 pages, is noise. Because all you need to know is that. Create a delta and keep it visible, committed, in the budget for the next 10 years.